Thank you, and you've, thank you very much. Uh, there's no time for clapping. Uh, so of course, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start talking right away. Um, so these are, you know, these are numbers, charts, and trends that you guys have seen before, right? And so the message here is that the problem that we're dealing with uh, when in healthcare, uh, at least some of the really high impact issues that we're facing, are really a problem of scale. Uh, okay, and the, the issue, of course, is that the kinds of trends that we have really don't make this problem sustainable. Um, now, many of us here are coming from the perspective of developing technology, and myself, uh, I would be included in that category. And if we assume for the moment that technology uh, can be scalable in some form, um, the question really is that technology becomes interesting in addressing this problem if whatever form of scalability that is can be translated into addressing this problem, which is really a problem of sort of clinical responsiveness, right? So uh, the issue here is that we've got a large population to monitor. A lot of this cost originates because of expenses that we face in hospitals and clinics. And of course, the sensor network gives us this opportunity to move this kind of care outside. But what we really need are devices that can make inferences that are relevant at a clinical level so that we can generate very selective triggers to engage those clinical resources, which are limited in capacity. So the moment that technology scalability can be translated into that sort of form of what I call clinical responsiveness, that's when technology becomes interesting in addressing this problem. And so what we've really focused on and what I encourage you all to look at and, and sort of be critical of as well is sort of what are the algorithms that these devices in the sensor network can run, so that these are not just instrumentation tools, that these are actually tools for performing some sort of clinical decision support or advanced inference. Um, and just to sort of give you a perspective of this problem, the problem that we face is that the kinds of modalities that we have available, so the kinds of signals we can sense, look something like this, right? So this is the EEG. In fact, this is the EEG of an epileptic patient. Uh, and the reality here is that this signal has some very rich but complicated physiology embedded in it. So it starts off in these you know, single units as these spikes and these populations of neurons. It becomes some local field potential. That diffuses through volume conduction through the brain, crosses the skull, which has its own frequency response, and then it ends up on the scalp as this 10 or 20 microvolt signal. And we need to be able to determine with very high specificity what their clinically relevant information here is. For example, in this case, that there's a particular pattern here that corresponds to the onset, perhaps, of a seizure. Okay? And we need to be able to do this with the sensitivity and the specificity and the latency of a neurologist who might be analyzing this signal continuously so that we can, for example, identify it before the start of those um, clinical symptoms, perhaps for some closed-loop therapeutic device or for some uh, directed monitoring device. Um, now, what's the challenge with that? There's a lot of challenges. I just want to raise a couple of them because I think that these will help point us to some possible solutions. Uh, and the basic problem is that a signal like that Though embedding very rich information is an extremely complicated, physiologically speaking, an extremely complicated signal. Now, people have done very good work to try and model it at sort of the neuronal circuit level, right? So they've modeled the dynamics of how a seizure begins uh, and so on. And these are very interesting and important for us to understand these sort of pathophysiologic conditions. But unfortunately, they don't necessarily form the basis for the kinds of accurate detectors that we need for this process to scale into the outpatient domain uh, and very large patient populations. Uh, and the other issue that we have is that, you know, there are very interesting and very high specificity modalities that are available in the healthcare domain. But those are not the kinds of modalities that we have access to in these low power chronic monitoring uh, sorts of systems. What we have access to is something like that. Uh, and as you saw in the previous slide, that comes about as a result of some very complicated physiology. But we now have to be able to identify specific states, despite the fact that this signal is not nearly as, uh, does not offer nearly as high specificity as a modality like the one above, we have to be able to discriminate between very particular sort of dynamic responses that are expressed in the signal. For example, we need to identify the onset of this clinically important event, a seizure onset, versus some other transient first which might be some physiologic activity. That's actually spindle activity from normal sleep uh, EEG, okay? 
So these signals are very nonspecific, the signals that we have available, and we need to create high order models in order to be able to differentiate between those different expressions. Now, in addition to that, we also have the problem that the way that these pathophysiologic or these interesting events are expressed in these signals is variable from patient to patient, and in fact, it might be variable over time. Okay? So there's been very important clinical work that says, look, there's a spectral band that corresponds to the onset of seizures, but in fact, if we look at a particular patient, both seizure activity and non-seizure activity is expressed with much higher specificity. So for example, uh, this pathology, this normal burst, uh, in this case of this particular patient, could very easily, very closely resembles what you might think is seizure activity. And in fact, a neurologist looking at this might think that a seizure has occurred here, even though there's been no clinical seizure. In fact, for a particular patient, the seizure is expressed in this particular case with much higher specificity, both spectrally and spatially across those channels. And so there's a lot to be gained by being able to take into account the information on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. But now, when we're talking about this network that's going to scale to a large population, how do you make that customization process scalable? Because now we're dealing with, uh, of course, a limitation where these clinical experts need to be involved in this process. So we are very interested in, and, and I would sort of encourage you guys to give us feedback and, and to look in these areas of data-driven monitoring, modeling. Data-driven modeling and algorithms are basically the idea that we're going to bypass trying to understand these things to some extent on, a physiologi on the physiological level, uh, and instead just going to observe these signals and try to develop models for them. And the reason that this is a promising approach is because we now have some very efficient tools from the domain, for example, of supervised machine learning. And if you're not familiar with these, of course, I'd be happy to talk in a lot more detail. But the message here is that we have tools that allow us to analyze data and construct these models in very systematic and efficient ways that we can then apply. And the question is, how can we apply these in these small-scale, energy-constrained devices? Uh, and the answer is perhaps by taking advantage of the structure that we have in these algorithms. Okay, and of course, the other point here is that when you go data-driven, the benefit you have is that nowadays we have access to a lot of data. That exists in the form of electronic records, but it also exists in the form of your sensor network, right? So your sensor network is not just an instrumentation tool. It's perhaps a tool now that acquires data, and data through some of these techniques can be converted into knowledge. Uh, and that can help facilitate a customization process. And those are algorithms that actually do work. And we've got uh, cases of those and are developing those and are starting to implement them on customized uh, uh, specialized sorts of processors. Uh, I'm not going to go into these uh, details uh, or into these examples in too much detail because I'm sure I'm going to get tackled here in a second by our very good uh, moderator. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about them in a lot more detail. These are cases where we're starting to use these sorts of algorithms in real devices uh, and actually use them in sort of chronic systems. This is a, a device for chronic seizure uh, monitoring, uh, which is based on um, actual uh, testing on recorded patient data from the Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, we've done case studies to sort of understand where are the limitations of using these algorithms, and it turns out that really the high order and high accuracy and specificity that these models give us is great, but it also poses an energy limitation. And if you try to compromise on that, you start to degrade your sensitivity and specificity in some of these detectors. So based on these sorts of case studies, we're starting to understand what it would take to actually incorporate these kinds of algorithms into uh, real practical low-power devices. Anthony uh, just gave a very interesting um, discussion about the Continuum Alliance and the great work that they're doing. What we're also interested in is, you know, these, all these, through IEEE 11073, there's all of these interesting devices that have really been wellness-oriented for telemetry exchange and interoperability in these networks. But, you know, we're envisioning this case where these models are being, uh, there's transactions over this network where these models are being exchanged with clinical experts and then being downloaded. And we're working with the 11073 working group, in fact, to uh, figure out how within that framework we can um, uh, accommodate the exchange of this sort of information over a network. Um, so the summary is over here. I think, uh, you know, data is sort of a resource that we should view uh, as something that could be the basis for generating new knowledge. And the question is, how can we make the decision support based on that data uh, be automated uh, and distributed in order to make this network scalable without overburdening those clinical resources that we have? Thank you. Thank you.